Okay, guys, my name's Scott Campbell. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the weir combination equipment and range. Uh, and at the end of that, I shall give you a, a chance to field any questions that you have. So just a little bit on safety to begin with. We're, we're very keen on health and safety, as any of these big organisations are. But we are, have a total zero harm policy and we monitor very closely right across the globe our safety trends and always aim for zero harm and zero environmental issues. Um, just some of the stuff we've been doing in like the last 12 months with the COVID. Most air facilities are running on skeleton crews, which means we've now got a lot of people working from home. So to overcome that and to try and keep the community together, we do online video therapy exercise sessions, uh, mindfulness clinics where people can attend, speak to specialists, and also virtual cafes where we have a chat once a week. Everybody's allocated a group of 10 colleagues, and we just get together and talk about a book or some music or something like that, and we have a different theme every week. And it's just to keep the community and the family of we are functional and everybody making sure everybody feels included in the business, even though we're all currently working remotely from home. Your presenter today then, Scott Campbell. I've got 30 years plus in heavy engineering and mining. I started as a field service engineer back in the late 80s and I've worked my way up through the industry. And now I am the Commonution Manager for United Kingdom. Uh, previous companies, are, so I started at Tarmac when I was an apprentice. But pretty much from then, all I've done is work with OEMs. So I've been with Atlas Copco, Metso Minerals, Cat out in West Africa, and then Sandvik in West Africa. So I've got a, a wee bit of experience with crushing, screening, and so on. Today, I'm just going to give a very, very quick overview in the product range. Uh, I really want to speak more about our design and manufacturing, give you a couple of reference projects, and then give you a chance to ask any questions at the end. So we are a massive company globally. As you can see there, we've got uh, production facilities right across the planet in various sectors. But basically, this will be our 150th year or as an engineering company. In 2010, they branched out into the Comminution range. And in 2014, we bought the trio range of products and have been enhancing that ever since. So it's a total product offer now, right across the full mining and construction industry. All our machines are CAD modelled. Um, we do full finite analysis of all of our equipment to ensure that it meets the needs of the industry. Our goal is for zero breakdowns and zero, zero issues, uh, mean time between failures, etc. Our production facilities, basically in Europe, we've got two main centres where we build combination equipment. Uh, Venlo in the Netherlands, where you can see in the next slide, one of our TP600 crushers getting put together. But it's also where we build our high pressure grinding rolls, which are used for the, the finer products um, in combination. Just some pictures from the facility itself. And this is our production facility in Poland, where we put together screens, any machines ordered in Europe, pass through this facility and are put together to the customer spec, all within the usual health and safety remits for the region. What we've done over the last few years is we've built up, so we started small, we've took our ISO accreditation up to a total quality management system, where we are classed as world class, and manufacturing any equipment leaving the facilities fit for purpose with zero defects. And that's our goal right across all of our product ranges. So it's pumps, cyclones, screens, crushers, any item that leaves a rear facility must meet that uh, standard of production. I don't know if everybody's aware, but basically what, what we've done, we already had uh, a good chunk of the process equipment within our portfolio. And basically what we've done now is close out the full loop. So we can offer a total minor quarry package from start to finish and handle every product within that site. 
so you've got one stop shop for all your comminution needs. We make a range of crushing equipment. So we've got primary gyratories right down to the high pressure grinding rolls. So we can handle the very biggest stuff right down to the very finest stuff and make it into whatever product you need for your particular customers. The product range, as well as having the main components, so your jaws, your impactors, your cones, your screens. We also have all the other things that you need as well, so feeders, washers, all that type of equipment is all within the Weir family of products. So at no point should you be struggling to find a Weir solution to, to meet your needs. And as I've said previously, it's all designed to make your process more and more efficient. So I won't, I won't get into depth today, guys, on the, the full range of equipment. We could spend eight hours going through these. So I'm going to skip over the next few slides, but just so that you can keep in mind that these are products that are available to you and they're all there for anybody that needs to use them. So we've got our jaw crusher range. I was actually out yesterday commissioning one of these in Scotland with one of our field service engineers. We've got two cone crusher ranges. So we've got the heavy duty TC range and the high speed TP range, which everybody will be familiar with working in quarrying in the UK. We also do a full range of horizontal impact crushers, vertical impact crushers, and then the high pressure grinding rolls, which are very specialist, but are becoming more and more prevalent in the industry. From that, we then lead on to our screening technology. So we do a full set of uh, inclined screens, horizontal screens, and we do two ranges of those, your standard range, which you'll see in most industry, and then your heavy duty designed bespoke range. And these come from the very smallest, so the four foot right up to, I think our eight foot is a standard uh, product off the shelf. Our horizontal screens can be fully tuned to meet your application. A lot of screen manufacturers produce screens that are, you know, take this off the shelf, sit it in your structure, everybody's screen rock. Ours are actually designed so we can tune them, uh, we can change the stroke very, very easily. And when I say very easily, I mean it's a 20 minute adjustment to change the screen from a long stroke to a short stroke. We can also change the angle of the stroke. So depending if you're doing a, a coarse screening or a very fine screening, we can change the stroke. And that's all done via the gearbox. And the gearbox has access hatches that allow us to take off some small hatches, access the, the adjustment components, make the adjustments, and have your screen back up and running in a few minutes. We also have a full speed range that we can work in. So the pulleys are fully adjustable. So we can also change the speed of the screen to match our application. So fine screening, we can uh, have the correct speed range for the fine screening, likewise for the coarse screening on medium. We then move on to our heavy duty Enduron range. Now the Enduron range screens are very, very bespoke. So they're not the, the cheapest screens in the world, but that said, if you buy an Enduron screen, it's 100% designed for your application. So we go through a finite analysis. Every single Enduron screen that goes out is built to customer spec. You can see here, we're using these in mining, ores, coal, sand and gravel, recycling, wet screening, mineral processing, right across the, the raft of products. This is just one that I've been working on the last few months. Uh, it's a screen for a customer out in Nigeria. But you can see here the little guy circled at the bottom of the photograph. He's actually over six foot tall, that guy, standing next to one of our screens. This will be one of the biggest ones that we've, we've produced. I think memory serves me right. The screen box itself um, is over 50 tons. The tiny bolt on everything else. Uh, you're in about 80 odd tons for the, the screen. So you can see here, it's very, very custom designed, bespoke for the customer, but we can do the full range, like I said, from four foot right up to monsters like this. 
We then have the dewatering range of screens. A lot of you guys will be more than familiar with these type of screens, but again, these can also be designed. You can see in the photograph in the bottom right, we're doing two products off of the one screen. So it's a wide footprint, but we can make the two different products to, to suit your needs. You can then have a flap at the beginning to blend the products. Different customers have different needs for the products they're making at their site. And we help you to blend those products to meet the particular customer needs. We also do a full range of screen media. So if you've got a requirement for wire mesh, polyurethane, rubber, that all comes straight out of weir produced facilities as well. So all built to European standard. We do a full range of washing equipment. So spiral washers as shown here. Uh, we also do blade mills. This is a, this is a bit, I mean, it's, we could spend hours today talking about the all the different pieces of equipment. Everybody's familiar with most of the, the comminution equipment in the industry. Um, but this is a bit that I, I wanted to concentrate on today. How does we are, as a business support you as a customer out in the field. A lot of customers have technical challenges and they kind of accept those problems and issues. Well, that's how it's always been. And that's just how it is. We, we reject that as a, as a problem. We work with you as a customer to find the solution that maximizes the output of your plant. And we do that in, in various ways. Typically, um, we start off with a discussion. We then come to a concept between yourself and myself or one of my colleagues, and we come up with a plan. So we use digital software um, to make a, a model of your plan. We then introduce the changes that you want, and we can see the efficiency savings. So we work with you to say, is this cost viable? You know, we, we've got examples of systems in Europe, especially one that springs to mind in Spain, where the customer was being asked to invest something like half a million pounds. And they're like, well, we've not budgeted for that. It's too much. We can't do it. But then we showed them that the payback on that initial investment was less than three months. And you've got more saleable product going out the back end. So it can be a no-brainer at times. It's just how that information is shared with you guys and then your management teams to, to help you take that progress forward and to actually make your plant more efficient. So you can see here, we do the basics. We identify the process, the process issue. We do a very basic uh, Visio AutoCAD layout to show you what the plant will look like. Uh, we can do a, what we call a sales layout, so something drawn up in SketchUp, and that lets you have a look at it from all different angles. But ultimately, what it's leading to is a 3D walkthrough of the plant. So I take it everyone will be familiar. They'll all have seen some form of process flow in the past. Um, so everybody will be more than familiar. We are no different from any other OEM. We, we put all of your data into our program and then add in the equipment to, to meet your needs. We take that forward to what we call a project phase. So you can see here, you get a basic layout of how the plant will look. It's very easy to move things on paper. It's not so easy to do once the, the, you know, all the conveyors are sticking up in the air and you think, oh, I never thought of that. So we work with you to find the plan that meets your needs most effectively. The beauty of these designs is we can actually drop them onto Google Earth. So you can see your plan with your proposed changes in the process and how that's actually going to look on the, the footprint on the ground. So it's a, it's a great overview. Our customers really like that sort of imagery because then they can turn around and when they're doing their presentation and say, here's what it actually looks like on the ground. One of the things we pride ourselves on though is what we call a brownfield project. So if there's a process improvement we can actually come in and scan your building. We can then drop the process straight into your building. So you get an actual overview of how it will look on your existing structure. And um, we've done this very successfully. A good few clients across the region uh, have really benefited from this because then they can visualize how it's going to work 
where everything's going to be, and moreover, their uh, installation engineers, etc., have an idea of exactly how it should look even before the equipment turns up on site. Just a different view of the, the previous process. So where this is all building to, once we agree uh, a way forward and how we are going to support your process, we get into the more technical design phase. And what we're ultimately aiming to do here is come up with a final flyby. So what's basically happening here, this is one of our customers who had a, a specific need and requirement. So we put the, the plant on the ground based on their actual uh, site specifications. And then the beauty here is you get the initial overlay, so it gives you a good feel of what the plant's going to look like, how it's going to be laid out. But what suddenly becomes important with these designs is that your health and safety team can jump in at this point. So what we've actually done here is we had a walk through with the HSE team from the customer, and they started to bring in things like, you know, walkways, access points, emergency stop, uh, lighting for the winter time. That all starts to get reduced here. So everything is done on a, a very finite analysis of the plant. But moreover, it gives you the chance to walk through your plant. And you'll get a model of this as well. So you guys can go away, you can play around with this, come back and say, well, I don't really like that handrail there. Can we move that? Can we make a gate at the top of these stairs? This type of stuff. Very easy stuff to do, guys. Very quick to do. It's a lot easier, as I said earlier, to do this on the ground rather than try and do it when the, the plant's been designed and put up in there and then everybody suddenly says, well, why is there no e-stops here? Or, you know, I, I'm, I've been out here working last night, a head torch on, and I couldn't see a thing, but we could have easily designed in for an extra 100 quid a, a, a light at the beginning. It's much easier to do it in this manner. So let that play through. It's only a couple of minutes to more to go. The reason we the reason we've used this one is pretty much got our full range of equipment in there. You know, you've got jaws, you've got feeders, you've got cones, you've got screens. You can even see the automatic belt adjustment there, overband uh, magnets, all that kind of equipment built into that plant. And it even allows you to do your health and safety analysis um, prior to the plan going up. So you can have your walkways marked out, any berms or anything that you need for walkways, they can all be in place before the plan even starts to go up. All right, and this is just an example of some plants that we've installed around the world. So you can see some here, North America, some in the UK, Kenya, Indonesia, Costa Rica. This equipment, guys, has been installed globally and used on a daily basis. Um, this copper iron or uh, mine in Chile, they were changing manganese weekly on the four crushers. We took that out to a three-month change out on manganese. But moreover, we, during that revamp, we impro improved the output in the overall mine. So the, the payback period for them, despite the initial capital outlay, was very, very quick. Um, you can see there Mongolia, Canada, Australia, 
were all over the place. And finally, our thing, our business philosophy, and this is the biggest message today, is to offer the total solution. So you don't have to jump around and then try and pull 10 suppliers together to, to make your process very easy or very efficient or to run 10 supply streams. We can offer that as a total package and work with you to make your sourcing very, very easy. That's the end of my presentation. Um, Michael will go on and cover some more of the in-depth stuff that he specialises in. So any questions, folks, that you'd like to go through? Just one quick one. Is the, uh, is the video available to uh, have a look at again at some stage? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can share that out, yeah. Yeah, that'd be good because that's, that's very impressive. In fact, the, that, that 3D, because especially that model that you showed there, I mean, that's... You know, that's quite a, quite a good setup with regards to sort of a sand and gravel operation, something like that. But the fact that you you can map that out in 3D and then do the, the flyby uh, yeah. so just well, to show, well, demonstrate it's a turnkey solution. Yeah, I'm yeah, impressed with yeah. that. That's very good. What what we actually did just before uh, just before Christmas, um, we had a meeting with um, our engineering team. Um, and a customer, and I'll, and I'll say the name, it was Bleeden up in uh, Sweden. And we actually done a, a finite walk through the plant. So we started at the very beginning and actually took their maintenance crews and their operating crews through the plant step by step. And the questions that came out of that were amazing. Mm -hmm. um, guys asking, how do, how do you access, how do you grease that motor? Oh, we, we never thought of that, you know, put a bit of walkway in here. And even simple things like, well, that's quite a, a small walkway. Can we make that 200 mil wider? And there were so many little changes that needed to be made in the plan. But it's very easy to do it before manufacturing. Trying to catch them up afterwards is just a nightmare, eh? So, okay. yeah, we, 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 we totally endorse that type of uh, thinking. It's, it's working smarter, not harder, eh? And I think it's a nice little touch that there's birds flying by as well. Oh, we can to, do to make it a little bit more real. <laughs> we'll even do your logos and your names on your overalls if you require. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very, very impressive. That's that's the future, isn't it? Seeing it laid out yeah. like that. Very good. And, and what you can actually do is we can give you in a, a 3D model that will come up in your iPad. So coupled with Google Earth, you can actually stand in the middle of the plant view it on your iPad and then look around, you know, look up and you actually see it right in front of you on the ground. Eh? Mm. Very good. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you for that. No worries. Well, you did touch on uh, cost analysis as well. Obviously, everything comes at a cost. You said you'd work with the company to um, justify the cost of the extra plant as well. Is, is that a part of the project and the, the yeah. analysis? The beginning. Yeah, uh, yeah. Pre pretty much. I mean, if you if you're looking for, you know, it's a, it's a small five foot screen. And you're looking one in, one out. Do you need to do a lot of analysis on a, a cheap piece of equipment? But if you're you've got a, a particular problem, you know, so you're starting to look at tons per hour, energy cost, stuff like that. We'll work with you. And um, so using your data, we'll we'll then analyze that data and come back and say, well, here's what we reckon the payback period is on this piece of equipment. So we've actually got what we call an engineered solutions team, and that's pretty much all they do is look at your processes. And guys, we're doing this for major mines, uh, right down to small uh, mom and pop operations. You know, we, we, we do this type of work with all customers, yeah? Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. I think I'll be, I think personally I'll be in touch as well. I know I've set the uh, means up, but yeah, there's there's definitely some work we can do on the side. Yeah, yeah. Totally here to support. Is the the trio equipment still made in China? The process we, plant. Part we've got different uh, production facilities, but our main production center is China. Yeah, but made to ISO standards. Okay. So every, everybody has their production facilities. But like I say, we do use the Venlo facility in uh, Holland. We've got production facilities in the USA. But our main centre 
of production is China. Our main design center for crushing technology is the United States. Our main uh, design center for vibrating technology, the screens, is South Africa. So pretty much the weir model, you know, we have production facilities and design facilities wherever the, they need to be around the planet. And that's the same with our full product range. You find the facilities all over the place. Supporting the products within Europe, we've got the facility I showed you in Lesno in Poland, and that's where we do production, uh, putting plans together, but also a stock holding of uh, spare parts. It's what we call our uh, central hub for Europe. And from there, we also support what we call NACA, so North Africa, uh, and Turkey, and Central Asia, out of Poland as well. So we've got production facilities all over the place, yeah. And it's all fixed plan, that you don't have any mobile equipment? We don't, we don't do uh, a tracked uh, set of stuff. In the United States, we can do it on trailers, you know, for tow along, but they don't meet European spec for size, et cetera. Roads uh, really don't do it. There's a philosophy behind that, and a lot of businesses, the big businesses in the UK, moved away from fixed plant. They all went down the road of mobile, and that was to get around sort of, you know, all the planning laws, environmental laws, et cetera. Ours are skid, skid mounted, uh, and they're skid mounted for a reason. It gets you past all of those laws, um, but it also gives you a, a more robust plan uh, and often a lot cheaper to run than the mobile stuff. We've all had it, guys, you know, the broken crankshaft, the, the piston through the block and everything, and your whole process is at a standstill. Uh, my name is Mike Callagher. I'm the um, product manager for the, for the Linotex rubber products um, that, that we are we are does. About 10, 11 years ago now, back in 2010, we bought the, the Linotex rubber business, basically because Linotex was, was well known in the industry as the, you know, the, 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 the best in terms of its wear performance. Um, so I'll just go through exactly why Linotex is, uh, is, is the best in terms of wear performance um, and protecting the, um, the various bits of, uh, of kit that, that we does. You're probably aware of, of Linotex as a, as a brand. The, the material is a, is a natural rubber. It's, it's red in color, so wherever you see a, a red material. Rubber is normally black because you normally put carbon black in to, to, to give rubber its properties. But because of the way we manufacture Linotex and, and because of the properties we need from, from the Linotex, we, we're able to pigment it red which gives you the, you know, the opportunity to, to really see the difference you know, between a, a black rubber and a, and a red rubber. Um, in terms of natural rubber, it's, uh, it's a, a natural polymer. It's coming from the Heva brasilianus tree. And the picture on the right there is, uh, is literally how natural rubber is grown and taken from a tree. That cup there is probably the size of a, of a general um, you know, coffee, coffee mug. And you'll probably get that amount of rubber out of a out of a tree every day, you know. So you're looking at a a, a mug full of, of of latex out of a out of a tree every day, and you know just to put that into context, we are use in the in the region of of, of tens of thousands of tons of of rubber. Um, so you can imagine the amount of trees that uh, that it takes to, uh, to to create that that amount of, uh, of rubber. As I say, it's from the Heva brasilianus tree, and we we process it um, in a liquid state. It comes out as a, a liquid. It's about the consistency of milk um, and uh, a milky white colour. So it's, we, we take it in the latex form, or more or less straight from the tree. Uh, we then put our our chemistry into it, including the, the, the red pigment. So the picture on the right is as you would get it from the tree, and we put uh, our chemistry in in it and the and the red um, the red pigment. And the difference really that we've got with with Linotex is the rubber can be processed. What non, rubber is normally processed in a 
in a high consistency, solid state. But um, what we do as uh, as the Linotex brand is we process it in uh, in a, the liquid phase, in a liquid compounding process. That's a proprietary patented process. The, the vulcanization process is patented. And we're the only people globally that, um, that are compounding in the, in the liquid state. And we do that because we maintain, you know, the, the, the properties of the, of the liquid latex out of the, uh, out of the tree. The, and I think the next slide there just gives you a bit of an idea of, of, of it's a bit of a busy slide, this one. But um, if you look at the top there, on the conventional process for, for the way normal people, uh, normal rubber producers manufacture rubber, they basically take the, the, the rubber from the, the latex from the tree, coagulate it, crumb it and, and dry it so it's processed in a in a dry form it's very similar to like a like a plasticine type material or a, or a blue tack material and the way you process the the additives into it to, to get the chemistry in is to put it through a, essentially what is two contra rotating rollers which is a very very high shear process it takes it up to 80 90 degrees c and it's very um, energy intensive to then, you know, basically make it into a, a finished rubber uh, component. With the Linotex process, because we're mixing in the liquid format, um, there's no high shear energy, um, and we, we basically maintain the properties of the uh, of the natural latex. So the the the, the process that the, that the the physical properties of the material are, are significantly better than, than you would do through a, through a conventional process. This basically shows the, the, the science really behind what I'm talking about there. That, this gives you a, a molecular um, a distribution of the molecular weight of the, of the polymer chains from a, from a standard natural raw rubber as it comes from the tree. So you can see there's a bimodal distribution there where you've got very, very long molecular chains, which gives, the, the, the longer the molecular chains, the better the, the properties of the rubber are. Now, in a conventional process where you put it through a very high shear, those, those polymer chains are basically cut and, and, and there is chain scission there to, to reduce the average molecular weight. So the black line there gives you an idea of what you would get for your, for your standard um, dry processed rubber. When we compound late, uh, latex rubber into linotex, we maintain that bimodal distribution and we have a significant amount of, of longer molecular chains there. And really that's the bit that's, that's giving us the, the, the significant improvements on its, on its performance in terms of its, its physical properties. So it's tensile strength, it's tear resistance, it's abrasion resistance. And that's really the, you know, the, the added advantage that you get with, with liquid compounding to maintain that, um, that long polymer, polymer um, and molecular weight of the polymer. We then take that into uh, into various applications, um, you know, pumps and, and cyclones. Uh, we have a, a range of, of Linotex uh, parts that are going into that, process equipment like screens that, uh, that, that Scott was talking about earlier, as well as uh, pipelining, uh, hoses for, for material transport, um, and one that we're, we're, we're seeing significant applications for at the moment is, um, is truck bed lining. Um, you know, that, that truck, I think that truck is a Komatsu 830. Um, and we're basically putting rubber panels in the bottom of that truck. Uh, and um, that, that, that takes uh, probably, I think, 230 tons of rubber. Um, and our, our panels have, have been working in those trucks for, for, for several years now. That, that, that the rubber in that truck is, is about 16, 17 tons worth of, of rubber just in those panels. Uh, the other thing that's, uh, that we've got as a, as a bonus really is, is the Solifix adhesive system. You know, where we've got rubber that's normally bonded to a metallic substrate um, in, in shoots, hoppers, um, you know, steel spools. Uh, and the bonds really there is is critical. You know, it, it, it may look like well, it, you know, it's just a glue, but um, 
you know, bonding rubber to, to various substrates. There's a lot of science and a lot of technology that goes into, you know, looking at, at getting the right peel strength, getting the material to, to, to adhere to the substrate. And, you know, we our Solifix adhesive system is uh, is the best to do that, you know, so you don't get any, any bonds delamination. And really, you know, the, in terms of the the properties that we get from from Linotex, uh, you know, it, it is a, a properly engineered polymer. You know, it's very low modulus, very very high mechanical strength. Elongation is is something like eight or nine hundred percent. A massive coefficient of friction. You know, we 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 normally we 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 supply uh, paper paper movement belts for 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 the paper movement industry because of the high coefficient of friction. I'm really in terms of the you know the, the the stuff that you guys are probably looking at. It's it's resistance to cutting and tearing. Um, you know, it, it's it's head and shoulders above anything else in terms of uh, abrasion resistance and and its wear performance against uh, most of the uh, most of the rubbers. And it's an environmentally friendly, renewable, sustainable resource. It comes from a tree. It's natural, um, and it's it's certainly a, a sustainable resource. This just gives you an idea of, of you know, what, what we're lining is, you know, shoots, hoppers, uh, washer barrels there. The, the picture in the bottom left-hand corner is, is the, the washer barrel before lining uh, and then lining with, um, with, with the Linotex materials. We also do sort of acid tank stuff. I mean, this is a, a, a phosphoric acid tank that um, is resistant to pHs of down to sort of, you know, below one. For, for various acid dip applications. Again, some, some more uh, shoots and, and hoppers, washer barrels with, with different rubbers in, you know, if you need different rubbers for, for lifter bars. Um, and this is a, a thickener plant where the, 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 the vast majority of the abrasion is, is on the outlet of that, um, that tank, that thickener settling tank. So the, you know, the outlets are, are covered in, in very high abrasion resistance linotex. And just to, to, to give you an idea of, of, of you know, what the, the linotex, uh, you know, added advantage is, this gives you an idea of, you know, we're, we're manufacturing in Kuala Lumpur, it's the, the only site at the moment that, um, that the rubber is, is manufactured in. You know, it's, a, it's an 18 acre site. Um, we've got six production lines there for sheets, molded products, uh, as well as hose and, um, and, and but mainly the, the, the rubber manufacturing. And this just gives you an idea of the, you know, the, the scale of the product. I mean, you know, we, we, we see, you know, our, our competition supplying a red rubber and, you know, we, we can, anybody can, to, can make a, a rubber red, but, um, you know, to give you an idea of, of the process, uh, you know, this gives you an idea of, of, of the scale of the process. Uh, it, it's a very, very capitally intensive process. We, we've been manufacturing Linotex now for, uh, I think it was developed in the, in, in the, the late 30s, um, 1930s. So, you know, there's a, a, a huge amount of capital that has gone into that, that process. Um, so, you know, the, the, the red material, as you say, you can get a red rubber, but, um, but there's only one plant making this, um, you know, this line of text material. That, that plant is running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and is producing, uh, you know, the liquid feed rates is a, it's saying 800 litres per hour there, but it's actually more likely triple that now because we've, um, we, we've extended that plant. And again, this is just showing the, the, the process. The process is a liquid process that we then need to take the water out of the out of the rubber. The water content is about 60% solids when it comes out of the tree. And then we need to take that water out to make it into the, the, the solid rubber product. Um, and again, looking at the output figures there, we're saying about 13 tonne of, of, of dry rubber a day. Um, that's probably, you know, almost tripled now looking at the um, expansion plan that, um, that we've got in, in Malaysia. And again, it's running 24 days, six or seven days a week. This should just shows the, the process as it goes through um, from, a, from a liquid where it's now a, a, dry, a dry process. Um, and then it's, it's basically put into, the, it's difficult to see the scale of this, but that, that 
um, machine at the top right hand corner is the continuous press process where the, the rubber goes in one end as a as like a plasticine type material and that presses the, the material at, at elevated temperature and, and high pressure continuously to that's about 12 13 meters long that machine and that's running 24 hours a day basically producing rubber sheets that are shown on the on the bottom right hand corner there this is the traditional type of process that the the normal rubber goes through so you as you see you've got two counter rotating drums and the rubber in the middle there is basically squashed through through those and that's a, that's the bit that causes very very high shear and, and causes the, the properties of the rubber normally to, to be reduced but this is this is just for for um, uh, you know lower lower um, property materials this is not actually the um, the linotex process and this is basically what we end up with at, at the end of it the, the sheet there on the on the table is, is the standard 10 10 meter long you know 1.2 meter wide rubber sheets that then get slit into into various thicknesses. Uh, anywhere down to 1.5 mil. The, the sheet normally comes out, uh, standard sheet is about 30, 30 mil, um, but we supply rolls from 30 mil thick all the way down to, to about 1.5. And this is just showing the slitting process. So the, the, the sheet there in the, in the bottom or the, the, the left-hand picture is a, a 30 mil sheet that is then slit into, into various thicknesses and rolls to... Um, you know, to, 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 to ship right across the world. And this, this plant pr produces all the, the, the Linotex rubber for the, for the Weir group globally. It, it's counterintuitive when, when you say, well, a, a rubber can, can outperform a, a steel. And this basically just is a, a quick slide to, to sort of demonstrate how it's doing that. Um, when, when you've got you know, material, you know, like a, 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 a metal or, a, or a, hitting a metal substrate, the energy has to go somewhere. So you get to a point where the energy of the, the input and the momentum of that stone or that rock is, is so much that it, it, it breaks the bonds of, of the steel and you end up with, with chipping and chunking of the, of the metal substrates. But with, with rubber added to, to you know, put onto the top of the, the metal, the energy is absorbed. The energy of the impact is absorbed by the rubber and is effectively just returned to the rock. So, you know, you, you get very, very little abrasion of the of the, of the metal substrates. And um, we, we can see, you know, we, we've got applications where, you know, something like a hard ox is, 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 is worn down in, in a couple of, uh, of months of, of use. But, you know, we've, we've got a, a rubber material on there that it's lasting you know five six seven times that um that 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 length with the same tonnage throughput this just goes it gives you an, an idea of, of the the differences in in wear of material depending on, on impact angle if you've got a very low impact angle you've got a, a different mode of wear. you've got um cutting and sliding abrasion with a, a, an impact angle up to about 10 percent but if you go up to a 70, 70 degree um, angle, the, the, the wear is different. So the, the, the material that you put into those applications is different based on, on you know, the impact angle, um, the size of the particle that is, is hitting the rubber. For, for high impact angles, you, you would use a harder rubber. Um, for low slide in abrasion, you use a, a softer rubber, um, and we can, you know, specify that depending on our, our customers, um, you know, particular processes. Again, this just goes into how we specify the various rubbers because the, 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 there are various rubbers available from the very low, very high abrasion resistance line of text material at the bottom left-hand corner there. Uh, right the way up to the hard materials like the the Linard HD70, which is more for you know the truck bed liner application, where you know that that truck is is taking um, rocks, you know, hard rock, granite rock of probably between 300 and 500 mil diameter, um, being dropped five or six meters into that into that truck. So that, that's a very different rubber that you would use for that than you would use for something like a like a cyclone cluster. 
you know, where you're, you're looking at sliding uh, abrasion uh, in, in, you know, it's a different, uh, it's a different mode of failure, a different mode of wear. And in terms of, uh, of where we are, I mean, we're, we're obviously, you know, we continue to, um, you know, to develop. We're, we're working with um, the, the University of Manchester, looking at, uh, at the next generation of, of rubbers in terms of where for, you know, we're looking at graphene and, and carbon nanotubes. So there's a lot of R&D that's going on in, in the background to, to develop, you know, the next generation of rubbers even though we're already sort of head and shoulders above, uh, above the competitive uh, materials. This just goes into some of the, um, the applications that we've got for, 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 for Linotex rubber in terms of pipes and spools. Um, we also make engineered hose anywhere from sort of uh, 50 nominal bore right the way up to sort of 600 nominal bore. Um, which are, are, are 12 meters long. We're also looking at, um, uh, we, we have products where we can put ceramics into rubber to get very, very high abrasion resistance. Um, and as I say, the, the, the truck lining type applications at the bottom there. Yeah, as I say, this, this is uh, one of the, the applications that, the, that we've, um, we've seen some significant growth in. And the, the benefit really that um, that rubber has here is 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 not just in in wear. It basically takes out an awful lot of the energy when when you're loading that truck from a you know as I say seven or eight meter drop. The energy that um, that that product is is imparting to the truck itself is, is huge. And, and I've seen you know that 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 truck on the on the left there. I've seen you know those those supporting struts on the side literally bent you know by 90 degrees you know it, it, it's unbelievable the amount of stress that uh, that these go through but with a with a rubber liner in there you know we're seeing and our customers are seeing significantly lower um, maintenance costs because of the the energy absorption properties of the of the rubber and this is a sort of smaller version of that. These are modular map panels. Um, again, we're seeing significant growth in, in this area where they're, they're bolting panels. So if you've got a, a shoot or a, or a screen that um, needs rubber coating, this is a lot easier in terms of their modular, their bolting. Um, the product on the left there is, is actually uh, a, a rubber that is, has got a, a white iron insert in. So we're seeing significant growth uh, there, in, in certainly in sand and aggregates in, in Australia, for example, where the, 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 the white iron has got a, a Brunel hardness of, a, of over 750 Brunel. So, you know, the, the rubber takes the impact of the, uh, of the larger um, material, but the, the white iron is there to, 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 to improve the, the, the cutting and sliding abrasion. And we're seeing significant uh, growth in that. And we can put, you know, white iron or, or ceramics in there as well. So in terms of in terms of engineered hose, we 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 do a product range a cut end hose. So you know we can supply a, a hose that um, you know you can cut on site to any length. Put a, a standard coupling on. Um, they're normally ten meters, ten meters long, anywhere up to sort of six hundred nominal bore. With our you know uh, our Linotex um, high abrasion resistant lining on. And we can supply those right where across Europe. And that's really, you know, the the applications that we're in: sand and aggregates, obviously mining, power industrial, processing, food processing, uh, and, and oil and gas. Any questions? Give me a shout. Yeah, Michael, I've got one that's probably not directly relevant, but a little bit of a an environmental one. Having been on holiday in Malaysia and seen the devastation with the rubber trees being cut down and replaced with um, palm oil, is the likelihood of Linotech rubber sustainable into the future? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Absolutely. I think um, although we were saying there that you know, the, the, the weir usage of, of rubber globally is in the tens of thousands of, of tonnes, um, that that's that's dwarfed by the you know by the you know the, the automotive industry in terms of tires. So Malaysia does have still have a significant business in 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 in, um, in natural rubber, but it, it's a global commodity. So you know it, it's it's also may uh, or grown in in Vietnam, Thailand. 
our proportion of the of, of the rubber business for for the mining industry is is a fraction of a percent of the of the global rubber usage. So yeah, I mean it's it, it's certainly still there and uh, and it will be for, for for a long long time to come. I think. Okay, thank you. Just another question: Is the Linotex products only available through concessions, or can you go directly through Weir? I live in the West Country of England. And generally, it's difficult to go direct. The, the way that the, the we the, the, we've structured the business, really, from a UK perspective, is we we now have a network of um, of UK distributors, which are, are basically trained to to apply and to to bond the the, the materials. So, depending on on what particular application, it would normally go through it would normally go through one of our, our distributors. Um, if, if you guys in in the south is probably um, the southwest vulcanizing, that that would probably be the you know the, the easiest route, but basically because they've got the expertise to to, to bond the, the the materials to to any any substrates and to to actually apply it because it, it it's it's quite an it was not an involved process but um you know you you can or, or customers can have problems you know if 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 they don't use the proper bonding additives or, or they don't bond it properly it's it, it's it's quite a, an involved process and, and we found that you know we we get the best long-term quality from people like our distributors who can apply it in in, in the correct manner really yeah, I understand that. But where would we go for technical information and support on a an innovative trial, trying something different rather than what we've always done before, where we'd need advice on perhaps the right type of rubber and whether it is even possible? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we can certainly um, you know give you you know, I mean, effectively that that, that that's me. The rubber is a very important part of of we as business, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm covering the rubber business for for all of uh, all of Europe. So yeah, I mean, if you've got a particular application, you know that the, you know, it needs some weird and wonderful property. You know, I've 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 been in the rubber industry for oh God, probably about thirty years now. So you know, I've I've done if if it's rubber, I've I've made it, manufactured it sold it and tested it so if there's a rubber application out there then uh, you know and you need something then you know certainly I, 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 I'd be your first point of contact there okay I'll be looking up your number in after the, uh, the presentation thank you I'll, I'll look forward to it okay I'll give you an example Clive of how that plays in within our structure I had a particular problem in Finland a number of years ago and I came back to Michael and I said, look, I've got this problem. Here's a way we're experiencing. And then between us, we looked at various rubber compounds. Michael could then plot that in a graph and say, if we go this route, here's your predicted life. If we go this route, here's your predicted life. And here's what we recommend. And then he added in ceramics. And what we actually came up with was a, a rubber line panel bespoke to the customer's needs. And it worked fantastically, yeah? Yeah, that's the sort of thing I'm looking for. Innovation. Does anyone have any more questions for Michael uh, while we're on the subject? One quick one, really. I've, I've seen the benefits of rubber in, in sort of extreme environments and turbulent environments, whether it's uh, warm and pump linings, pinch valves, other things like that. But there must be some applications where you can use a percentage of perhaps recycled materials in there. I know it's a sustainable business and obviously... You, you, you've still got that sensitivity of using the trees and, and potential source issues um, going forward. But have you been looking into sort of devulcanizing technologies or anything like that? So you can effectively put a percentage of recycled materials into some applications. I just wondered if, if that was something that's we're looking at in the into the future. So obviously being able to devulcanize rubber and then put it back to use, with, whether it's in the tire industry or or such as uh, wear industries, such as you do. Have you looked at that at all? Actually, a really interesting question. I mean, rubber is classed as a thermoset material. So where, where you've got thermoplastics, where you basically, they, plastics become 
plastic, you know, with with heat, with heat, rubber cures, and traditionally as 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 not being recyclable. That said, we we have you know done some work recently, and, and we're we've we've actually decross-linked rubber, uh, and certainly de- we've definitely decross-linked Linotex rubber. So yes, we 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 are looking at some um, processes. A fairly novel, um, and you know, it does literally rewrite textbooks because you know we've now made rubber decross-linkable, and we've put it back into into products. Normally, recycled rubber, it's normally crumbs, and and you you get very very fine dust that you can put into material, which normally just reduces the you know the 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 properties of the material that um, that you end up with, but. Because we've actually chemically, mechanochemically de- decross-linked it, the, the properties that we get are almost identical to the original properties. So yeah, we we, we are actually doing that, and there's a, there's a big project on, underway at the moment from in Australia where they've just ordered um, 30 tons of that material to, to be recycled. So yeah, it's. Um, it's, 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 it's relatively brand new that, um, but but yeah, it's, it's it's definitely going on at the moment. Oh, thank you for that. Before you actually publicise that or launch that officially as a product, will you just let me know in advance so I can buy some shares, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's funny. I mean, when when I saw the the, the guy we're working with, he, he showed me this process, and, and I I said exactly the same thing. Do, do, do you want to sell the company? Because it, it, it is that, um, that that groundbreaking. So, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's a very interesting project, that one. Thank you. Thank you for Scott and uh, Michael there for a pretty comprehensive look at Weir Minerals and their uh, front-end products from the quarry uh, analysis and new design to the plant uh, on offer to uh, Michael's end, end, end products there, uh, very developed uh, rubbers there and what they, what they offer in that department.